five in three, two, All right. Hey there, students. Tom Ritchie here, and we are here for another live session with Marco Learning. And so going to get some uh, our AP Euro on. All right. And there is me actually like just waiting for the thing to happen there. So we have now started. OK. And so we are coming from my live stream earlier. We're now on Marco Learning's channel. If you have not subscribed already, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And so going from there. Um, we don't necessarily have a topic here. You know, my live reviews on my channel have been, uh, you know, going in the sense of, you know, being focused on a topic or a period. So we're taking questions on everything. Okay. Now, um, as far as that goes, Sam, how did the Edict of Nantes affect the Congress of Vienna? Now, the Edict of Nantes was, I mean, this is the French Wars of Religion. This is the late 1500s. I would not say that there was a big causal anything between the Edict of Nantes and the Congress of Vienna. And in fact, the Edict of Nantes, uh, you know, this is something that kind of opens up um, things for the Huguenots. Okay. So as far as that goes, uh, you know, that uh, you've got Henry the Fourth, who was a recovering Huguenot, we can call him. Paris is worth a mass. And so that is in the 1500s. And then when you, we look at the Congress of Vienna, that's after Napoleon. Okay. So I would say that there's not really too much of a connection there. But I also want to note something here that, you know, speaking of the Edict of Knots, let's go ahead and just make sure y'all know about this wonderful little page here with some review guides. We got 10 topical review guides um, that I have, uh, you know, that I've put together for you here with my friends here at Marco Learning. And, you know, this is marcolearning.com slash AP Euro. And perhaps if we could get, uh, you know, if, uh, if Elena, if you're, uh, you know, in the background there, if we can go ahead and get that maybe on a pinned chat so that people know that they've got access to these free Free study guides. Now, also, Marco Learning has free practice tests. Okay, so free practice tests, free study guides. Um, so with that, we've got a lot of stuff that focuses on the earlier period. So the Italian Renaissance and the Northern Renaissance. And each of these has some key vocabulary, goes into continuity and change. It'll go into an art movement. There's a bit on Petrarch, the father of humanism. So we see Erasmus there, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, the one on the Northern Renaissance and a bit about Northern Renaissance art. So a lot of these things here, now, the reason I brought that up is because one of the handouts we have here, uh, one of the, you, you know, one of the topical guides is on the wars of religion. That's the French wars of religion and the 30 years war. OK, so we've got some things here. So noting that Henry IV issued the Edict of Knots. Now, we also want to note that the Edict of Knots issued by Henry IV of France, Henry of Navarre, was an expression of politique or, you know, on the test, one of my students once called it politique, which is fine because it's a written test and literally nobody at the reading will know that he pronounced it that way. That'll just be kind of my own little private joke. So we want to note that the Huguenots were French Calvinist, okay? They were French Calvinist Protestants. And then, of course, politique, this is where you are putting political concerns ahead of religious concerns. So Henry IV of France, um, he was, uh, you know, a former, I call him a recovering Huguenot, but when he realized he won the French wars of religion, but he realized that the French people were not, they were not going to, um, tolerate a Protestant king. And so he converted to Catholicism. Paris is worth a mass. And so from there, he issued the Edict of Nantes, giving a uh, religious toleration to Huguenots in certain areas of France. Now, in certain cities, especially because Huguenots tended to be in more urban areas in France. So with that, uh, you know, when we look at the politics, we think about the French wars of religion. And of course, that kind of goes over to the Thirty Years' War. Now, Gustavus Adolphus, very important guy there, right? The Lutheran king of Sweden. But also when we 
think about politique, that drove France's decision. OK, so France, uh, you know, is thinking in terms of politique when they intervened in the Thirty Years War on the side of the Protestants. OK, so the Thirty Years War kind of starts transforming from a local religious war in the Holy Roman Empire to a continental and political war. And so uh, that is something that we see with the politique. Now, another thing that I think as well, if you think about, okay, what is going on in terms of, if we were going to look at politique, and then we were also going to look at Clemens von Metternich, okay, when we think about the Congress of Vienna, um, that when we think about Clemens von Metternich and the way that Metternich is at the Congress of Vienna, I'm sure there are some people that wanted to punish France, okay, but at the same time that Metternich is uh, you know, not wanting to punish France because he says we need a balance of power. So he puts aside, he helps the conference put aside any kind of goals that people have of punishing France, of collecting reparations, and just doing what is best for Europe as a whole. Now, speaking of Metternich, I've got a rap about Metternich. Does anybody want to hear that? I mean, I don't want to force y'all to hear me rap or anything like that. I mean, certainly not. Far be it from me to, you know, force y'all to uh, to listen to me rap, but let's see in the chat if y'all want to, uh, you know, if y'all want to listen to that or not. Okay, so let's see what the what the chat says about all of this. Now, actually, doesn't look like uh, I tried to do something with the chat, and there we go. Okay, A N Tuber. All right, so I uh, gave Marco Learning a super chat there. So with that, yes, rap one red rose. That, okay, please rap. All right, well, let's go ahead. You did a super chat. I'll go ahead and do a little bit of my Metternich rap. What up, Europeans? It's the ladies' pick. Austrian Prince Clemens von Metternich, aristocracy savior. I'm the man of the hour. Going to carefully restore Europe's powers, balance of power. Eat nationalists for breakfast. Liberals for my dinner. Got to be conservative if you want to be a winner. I'm the coachman of Europe, so you better hold your horses because all the great powers are about to join forces. Napoleon thought he was too big for Elba, so we put him on a boat straight to St. Helena, threaten European peace, so we set him a drip. Shake the French Revolution off like Taylor Swift. Come on, Talleyrand, take a seat at the table because Europe needs a France that is strong and stable. There's no need to punish France. I just want to keep order and restore the old 1791 borders. The liberals have ideas that they want to express, but I shut their mouths up when I censored the press. Stability within and between European states is the form of this order that I want to create, that I'm trying to create. So join me in Vienna where a Congress is in session. Together Together we can stop the revolution from progressing. This conservative order, no, it ain't going to fall because I build coalitions like Trump builds walls. All right. Is this Kanye? Gosh, that was back 2015. It's hard to believe that this was, this is like an eight-year-old rap. Uh, I got to get some more of those written. I'm not a rapper, but yeah, the, uh, at the time now, you can find that on my SoundCloud if you want to listen to some of the uh, AP Euro raps there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, at the time, I think that, uh, you know, Taylor Swift, like some of the cultural references are kind of 2015-ish, but, uh, but you like that. Okay. Glad to see that. And so, but again, you can hear the whole rap on my, on my SoundCloud. So what is the difference between separatist movements and nationalist movements? Now, I wouldn't get too caught up in like, most separatist movements are nationalists because when you think about this, now I'm not a rapper, okay? But a separatist movement is typically a movement of an ethnic group within a community, and that is a nationalist movement. So let's think about what nationalism is, okay? That when we think about what nationalism is, a nation, when we think about nationalism, a nation, these are people who share common cultural traits, okay? Now, among these common cultural traits could be religion, okay, or first of all, language, okay, it's very, very difficult to form a national group without a common language, okay, so a common language is a very important ingredient in nationalism, um, and then, of course, you know, there can be other cultural traits that, for example, if you share a religion, you know, so when you think about somewhere like Poland, where to be Polish is 
to be Catholic uh, by and large. Greece, to be Greece, Greek is to be Greek Orthodox. Now, not necessarily that everybody is devout or actively practicing, but for some people, religion is part of their nationalism. Now, in France or the United States, uh, you know, religion is not necessarily part of nationalism anymore at this point, but we have what's called a civic nationalism. So you could say that in the United States today, that it's not that being, uh, you know, a certain religion religion makes you American, but part of being an American is a belief in religious toleration. Part of being French, you know, whether you are a French Catholic or a French atheist or, you know, a French Muslim, that, you know, this belief in, this basic belief in secularism, okay, that the French say that we have a secular state. And so in a you know, in a national, you know, a nation is this group of people who they identify, okay, they identify. So when we think about the Greek independence movement, for example, that is a great example of nationalism during the age of Metternich, that the Greeks, they are a, you know, they have their own language. They're a Greek-speaking Christian minority in the Ottoman Empire that were, they were concentrated in a certain area. And they said, you know what, we are a nation. Now note this, a nation is a group of people that identifies as a group, okay, as a nation. And then a state is a political boundary. So when we're thinking about that, now sometimes nationalism can result in unification. So when we think about Germany, when we think about the German Confederation, that this is something that when we consider the German Confederation, you had these 39 German states. And these are people who share a common language. So there were people who then started to say, as nationalism becomes a thing, that they're saying we should build a German nation. Of course, the revolutions of 1848, the Frankfurt Parliament. I've got a five-part series on the revolutions of 1848 on my YouTube channel. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, can I cover the CDS model? Let's make sure that, uh, you know, that we're noting, uh, noting there. Um, so just being like clear in your questions, okay? Now, um, Hassini, I do not have any predictions on what I'm going to, uh, what the topics of the test may cover. Um, I don't think that it's a good idea to try to forecast the test because you're only going to take it, uh, you know, you're only going to take the test once, which means that now if I were going to take the test 10 times, I might start thinking about the probability they're going to use for this and this and this. But since I'm only taking the test once, then I have to figure out in terms of that it could really be anything. So instead of trying to guess what the DBQ is going to be about, then I'm going to think about, let me make sure that I know how to write the DBQ. OK, let me make sure I know how to write the DBQ and let me make sure that I know this process so that I can get a four or five on the DBQ out of seven, even if it's on a topic that I don't like. And with the LEQ, instead of trying to guess the LEQs, study as much as you can generally and then pick the best LEQ that typically, you know, if you're prepared for the test, there's going to be one of those three LEQs that should work for you. So. As far as that goes, donated your life, your two dollar life savings to Marco Learning. That is that is great. All right, best two dollars you ever spent. Um, who are the most? Oh wow, we got we're asking a few times. Um, who are the most important people that you think we should definitely know? Okay, so as far as that goes, who are the most important people that you should definitely know? It really depends on the era. Okay, and you know, focus on the people that come up. Now, for example, when we look at marcolearning.com slash AP Euro, I go into some of that in these study guides. Okay, so we see that there is uh, Prince Henry the Navigator. We've got Petrarch. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, we've got Erasmus. So starting off, I would definitely start with some of these guides here that I have, you know, started with uh, Petrarch. And then I also have here Machiavelli. So Petrarch, Machiavelli, there are a few people that you should know. 
um, pick a Renaissance artist of your choice, doesn't matter which one, okay? Then we think about Erasmus of Rotterdam, Thomas More. These are both great people to know for the Northern Renaissance, okay? So I'm just kind of going through these guides and going through some people that I think would be, would be helpful. So the printing press, okay? Like we're thinking about this, Martin Luther and Galileo. I think that these would, you know, because we're thinking about the Protestant Reformation, so Martin Luther, Copernicus, and Galileo. So if you go through these study guides that we've got here at marcolearning.com slash AP Euro, you know, you'll see Prince Henry the Navigator, uh, you know, Francis Xavier. So the people that I'm including in these guides, now note, we've got some more recent ones like 18th century art and culture, which is kind of going into the culture of the Enlightenment era, looking at Enlightenment literature, looking at neoclassical art, Jacques-Louis David. So again, um, on these guides here, when we think about Montesquieu, for example. So when you see people in bold, I'm letting you know that, you know, this is something that would be useful. Of course, Otto von Bismarck, somebody that is very, very important. So note here that nationalism, nationalism can, can be in a couple of, in a couple of contexts here. If you've got a number of states that have people who speak the same language and share certain cultural values. When you think about, for example, Grimm's fairy tales, that is an example of, you know, when we when we hear the story of Hansel and Gretel, for example, these were traditional German stories that you would learn if you lived in Prussia or you lived in Saxony or you lived in Bavaria, that the Germans had some of these shared stories, kind of like the prominence of Shakespeare in the English speaking world. Um, when we look at the printing press, um, we see one of the things about the printing press is the creation of national literary cultures. So that's something to kind of think about that the printing press starts to spread works in the vernacular language. So when we think about in Italy, for example, uh, you know, in the English speaking world, we read Shakespeare and Dickens, but Shakespeare and Dickens, they're not going to be read widely outside the English speaking world. So when you think about if you're a young person growing up in Italy today. You're not going to read Chaucer's Canterbury Tales because you're not learning the English, you know, the history of English language literature, but you're going to read Boccaccio's Decameron. You're going to read some of Petrarch's sonnets rather than Shakespeare's. You're going to read Dante's uh, you know, Inferno and these things that are classics of Italian culture. So when we think about Italian unification in the late 19th century, Italy has a lot of these different political states, but the Italian people are seeing themselves more and more as a nation trying to put together an Italian nation that brings back the glory of ancient Rome and the glory of the Renaissance period and all of that. So with that, we want to think about some of these things in turn, but I think that this is a good start. MarcoLearning.com slash AP Euro. Very good start here. Also, you can look at Marco Learning's AP Euro playlist um, that you can see if you just go to Marco Learning's uh you know, Marco Learning's channel here, um, and you look at the videos and the playlist, you'll be able to see the overviews that we've got for units one through nine. We've got a whole, um, at Marco Learning, a whole AP Euro review series, okay, that that's something that it goes for all the way from unit one to unit nine. So, uh, so from there, um, now actually, Corey, I just, on my, um, what I've got here, Corey, um, the, so the Soviet Russia during the Cold War, I actually just did that topic on my channel, so I'm not going to address that here, okay? So the Cold War, we already addressed on my channel. You're welcome to watch that stream that just happened there. So going from there, um, Enlightenment philosophes and their respective beliefs, okay? Now, Mr. J, I've got a, you know, a great, now we've got a video here on Marco Learning's channel that is going over the scientific revolution, the Enlightenment in general, and then I've got a series on the Enlightenment. But as far as that goes, let's go ahead, and there is actually a handout uh, that I'll share with you 
causes of the French Revolution. Um, if you put, if you Google causes of the French Revolution, Tom Ritchie, okay, you'll go to a page on my, yep, we've got something here, and I'll go ahead and post that in the chat. Uh, and this way, we're going to kind of do a little two for one here, because I'm going to share a handout with you that I think will be helpful for you. And then we will go ahead and get uh, get to it here. So causes of the French Revolution. Now you've got the French financial crisis. That's part of what's uh, creating this crisis of the French Revolution. France lost the Seven Years' War and lost its North American colonies. Uh, France got involved in supporting the the American Revolution, both financially and militarily, that added debt that strained the French government's finances. Of course, that huge palace at Versailles that uh, has to be maintained and the high standard of living of the royal family. And it's not just a spending problem, France is also having problems collecting taxes, okay? So as far as that goes, the church and the nobility, they were exempt from taxes such as the tile, which was a head tax that was collected from the third estate. So the third estate were, they were taxed the most, okay? And then you can actually, there's another thing you can do here, the three Let's see, the three estates explained, um, Tom Ritchie, and that'll take you to something here that will also, you know, be helpful there in not only noting the first estate and the second estate, the clergy and the nobility, but also noting that you've got three groups within the third estate, okay? You've got the bourgeoisie, the professional class, you know, people who have educations, they are working, uh, you know, non-manual labor jobs, um, the sans culottes, okay? These people who are more of like the urban working class. And of course, a lot of times we forget about the peasantry who at the time of the French Revolution were the most numerous group. But with that, we see that the third estate is actually collecting all, you know, they're paying the tile, okay, that the other estates are exempt from. Now, also, the peasants are collect, you know, they're paying the tithe, like a, a tax that's collected directly by the church with no accountability from the government on how it's spent. Um, the old regime, pre-French Revolution government, just let the Catholic Church go around and collect this tithe, like basically 10% of every farmer's produce. So the French were having trouble trouble taxing, you know, collecting taxes as well. And so that's what leads to the calling of the Estates General. There's poverty among the lower classes, you know, grain shortages that, you know, on top of everything else, the French Revolution something of a perfect storm because France had two bad harvests in a row. So that's creating grain shortages. That's leading to higher prices. At the same time, too, the sans culottes in the cities, because France's economy, which is primarily agricultural, is suffering that the working class is facing lower wages. Of course, then there's the rise of the bourgeoisie, which I typically refer to, even though middle class is not problematic, I typically use the term professional class because these are educated people who don't work with their hands typically. And so this is, you know, when you look at this, like basically this is the class that has most of the delegates um, of the estates general. And so then Louis, of course, does not want to give the bourgeoisie respect at the estates general. So note here, the influence of Enlightenment philosophy. And if you want to get a refresher on the Enlightenment, um, that's available on my YouTube channel there. So with that, government is created by social. So we've got Locke, Voltaire, Montesquieu, and Rousseau, okay? I would say that these are four that are important for understanding the French Revolution. So as far as that goes, John Locke, and in the Glorious Revolution, the English Bill of Rights, we see that this idea that government does not exist because God wants the king to rule. Government exists to protect natural rights of life 
liberty, and property. Divine right monarchy is illegitimate. So when you compare that to the French Revolution that the French, they still have in 1789, this absolute monarchy. And this is something that the Enlightenment folks are you know, not too crazy about, this old style absolute monarchy. So then we look at Voltaire, and Voltaire is a big advocate of religious toleration. Now, Locke was as well. I mean, Voltaire is really, a lot of his thinking is really just derivative of Locke and Isaac Newton, that Voltaire is not, it's not so much that he has original ideas, but that he is very good at articulating and popularizing ideas that have been put out there by others who, you know, aren't as fun to read. So, you know, I mean, try to read one of Voltaire's works and then, uh, you know, try to read Locke's two treatises of government. You know, Voltaire's a lot easier to read. So then the idea that government power should not be consolidated in one place. Its powers should be separated in order to prevent tyranny. And then government policy should reflect the general will of the people. Now, Rousseau is kind of an outlier in the Enlightenment because Rousseau is not, I mean, he's not really as tied to rationality, okay? Because the thing about the Enlightenment is believing that rationality is more important than emotion, that basically emotion is going to mislead us, but rationality will take us in the right direction. So Rousseau is, uh, you know, a little bit out there, but he has this idea of his social contract. Now, I've got I've got a Locke versus Hobbes video and a Locke versus Rousseau video if you want to get something more in depth. And so government policy should reflect the general will of the people. OK, so Rousseau's ideas note that Locke and Montesquieu and Voltaire, I think, are more influential in that, uh, you know, in that early phase, that liberal phase of the French Revolution. And Rousseau is going to be more influential in the radical phase of the French Revolution. So just a little bit of a review of the Enlightenment, but also in the context of the French Revolution, because, you know, the French Revolution was partly inspired by Enlightenment philosophy. And then, of course, there is the ineptitude of Louis the 16th. Okay, so that's another thing that we'll see here that uh, Louis could be count on, counted on for two things, either indecision or bad decisions. Okay, not a whole lot of good decisions by Louis, or did I say 14th? 16th. Remember, sometimes honest mistake, but at the same time, we're talking about Louis the 16th. He is no Sun King, okay? And so as far as that goes, uh, Louis the 16th, okay? Because sometimes, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, the tongue slips. You always want to say, at least I always want to say Louis the 14th because he was so awesome. All right. So with that, um, you know, let me go ahead. So the Enlightenment and its uh, and its effects. OK, so how does the life of. OK, so one thing to note here, when we're talking about peasant life and serfdom, Eastern Europe and Western Europe. OK, so as far as that goes, that, you know, in the Middle Ages, you have serfdom in Western Europe and that sort of thing, you know, pretty much throughout Europe. But in the early modern period, like, you know, by the 1400s, 1500s, this practice of serfdom where the peasants are literally tied to the land and they can't leave. Now, remember, serfdom is a little different than slavery because the landowner does not own the peasants as property, but the peasants are tied to the land. Like, you know, if somebody's buying and selling the land, the peasants kind of like come with it and you were supposed to stay on that land. So, what we see with serfdom is in Western Europe, it is really going away very quickly um, by the time we get into this course. Whereas in Eastern Europe, um, serfdom hangs around for much longer. And in fact, in Russia, serfdom is not abolished until the 1860s. Uh, Alexander the 
Alexander II, who was something of a liberalizer. Now, Alexander II did not give up absolute power, but kind of did this whole in what you could consider Alexander II to be kind of a late blooming enlightened absolutist because Alexander II did reform government. Um, he was, uh, you know, trying to liberalize and expand the economy. Um, but then he was, uh, you know, he was assassinated. Um, some people, uh, you know, say he had a plan to come up with a representative, you know, body, a Duma. What am I drinking? I'm actually drinking water right now. So that's that's what I'm drinking at the moment. Um, so with that, um, some of the most important art styles. Now, that is a whole review in and of itself. And I plan typically I do a, an art review on my, you know, on my platform the night before the exam. So with that, but I would definitely start with Renaissance art. And of course, when we look at Renaissance art, whether it is uh, the Italian or the Northern Renaissance, one thing, a couple things that we've got, whether it's Italian or Northern Renaissance, that we have a um, essentially um, that there is this realism or naturalism that they want the art to look like real life. They do that through linear perspective. Okay, so when you're looking at linear perspective, this is the practice of you know making a two dimensional canvas or wall or whatever they're painting on this two dimensional surface look three-dimensional, linear perspective. And so they want, they're very obsessive with portraying, you know, humans and other subjects as they are. Now, a couple of differences is that, you know, Northern Renaissance art is more likely, and we've got that on these review guides um, at marcolearning.com slash AP Euro. Um, when we're looking at Northern Renaissance art, um, this is something that, you know, they are fond of mundane kind of things here. Okay. So for example, I like to use as evidence of, re of Northern Renaissance art on um, this, uh, this painting that I've got in the guide here, the harvesters. Okay. Bruegel, let me go ahead and share my screen again here that Bruegel has this, uh, this painting, the harvesters. And what we see is just some peasants. They're doing some work. They're taking a break. They're just getting that that grain harvested together. Now, what you notice here is it's a very kind of mundane, everyday kind of thing, but you notice the linear perspective, okay, that basically these people are closer than these people. So Northern Renaissance and Italian Renaissance art, they have that linear perspective in common that the town is out there in the background. So it's applying the basic principles of Renaissance art, but using it just to paint peasants that are harvesting rather than if we're thinking about Italian Renaissance art, ah, oh, you know, they're Plato and Aristotle and all of these, uh, you know, all of these great uh, Greek philosophers and uh, other philosophers as well, but mostly, mostly Greek and, uh, you know, some Romans here and there, but these classical philosophers and these classical statues and just this very, very grand kind of thing. This is more Italian Renaissance art because, you know, another thing is that Italian Renaissance art a lot of times is being committed by people with a lot of money, deep pockets, like, you know, the church and, uh, you know, the Medici and other families that are trying to make their, uh, their presence known um, as public benefactors. And so, you know, the Italian Renaissance art tends to be a lot more grandiose. But again, we've got the linear perspective. We have got, you know, this naturalism, this way of portraying, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, of portraying the, of the, you know, the people and the place so that when I'm looking at the painting, this is something that, okay, I think that uh, it actually looks real. Now, of course, that's something that sort of gets lost in, you know, 20th century modern art um, when we go into, you know, this, uh, you know, a, a more, it doesn't really matter like that. So, uh, so as far as that, uh, as that goes, um, so, <laughs> All right. So with that, the real starry night. Yep. So that's uh, that's me. I, I stole it and I'm just uh, hiding it in plain sight. So 
a review of the revolutions of 1848. Okay, so a review of the revolutions of 1848. Um, I would say here that I would definitely defer um, to uh, my five-part video on the revolutions of 1848. That's something that I would definitely make a note of, okay? So that is something that we want to... Uh, you know, note that's there, but the revolutions of 1848, let me go ahead and grab some, uh, you know, some slides here um, that, you know, just so there are some visuals for this. All right. So AP Euro, let's see, let's go ahead and open that. That's uh, industry and isms. So let's go into just the basics of the revolutions of 1848. All right, got that open. Let me go ahead and share that uh, share that screen. And here we go. All right. So, and again, I've got a proper lecture on YouTube. Now, the revolutions of 1848, they're happening in France. They're happening in the German states. They're happening in Italy. Um, so you've got these, you know, all through like Central and some of Eastern Europe. Now, note where they're not happening. You don't have revolutions of 1848 in Russia partly because Russia was very rural and also the Russian government was extremely, at that time, extremely repressive. And meanwhile, in Britain, where the government was being somewhat responsive to movements such as the Chartists, now not directly responsive, but the government had been responsive enough that Britain had at the time probably the most liberal of the governments that was uh, that was set up there. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, that's what we're seeing here. And so from there, the revolutions of 1848, several European nations were swept by a series of simultaneous revolutions. Two, these revolutions generally failed and conservatives regained power. It's just like earlier I was talking about the Hungarian, uh, you know, where sometimes they call that 1956 Hungarian uprising, the Hungarian revolution. I have a hard time calling it a revolution because it didn't result in a change of government. But when we look at the revolutions of 1848, there are some changes in government, but then again, there are also restorations of those old governments. So, for example, in 1848, Metternich fled from Austria because you had this violent revolution happening. But a few years later, Metternich is back in Austria. And so also Britain and Russia did not experience the revolutions that otherwise swept over the continent. So the revolutions of 1848 and the Crimean War, I would say that that this, you know, these are going on within a decade. You've got on one hand the revolutions of 1848 and on the other hand, the Crimean War, which puts Britain and France on one side and then, you know, with with the Ottoman Empire and Russia on the other, okay, which of course we see this happening over and over again, from Peter the Great's wars to the Crimean War to the current, uh, you know, conflict between Russia and Ukraine right now. That area around Crimea is a very, very strategic area, and so you know Russia wants it. Other countries don't want Russia to have it. This is something that cyclically goes through, and we're really seeing, I guess, the third iteration of this since Peter the Great, uh, of Russia wanting to control that area around Crimea and the Sea of Azov. And so with that, the age of Metternich is kind of ending with the revolutions of 1848 and uh you know, and the Crimean War. Those are the two things that kind of in the age of Metternich, where you had this concert of Europe and this uh, conservative order that really lasted for the most part, aside from the French Revolution of 1830 and the Greek independence movement, for the most part, for about 33 years, Europe was pretty stable and quiet. So just understanding that part of the Part of the reason why the revolutions of 1848 were not successful is you've got so many different groups that were involved. You know, you've got 
liberals, nationalists, uh, radicals that would include Democrats and socialists. Now, Democrats are just basically people who want universal male suffrage. Socialists want worker ownership of the means of production. So with that, just kind of understand what's going on there and that conservatives generally, you know, were able to restore, restore order in those quarters. OK, so as far as that goes, that's what we've uh, what we've got there. Who was Metternich? I forgot. Christine, you want to make sure that you know that Prince Clemens von Metternich, who was the foreign minister of, of the Austrian Empire, who was the dominating presence at the Congress of Vienna. And again, they called him the coachman of Europe because he was the person that was holding the reins, not just of Austria, but as you know, of Europe in general. So again, yes, nice job, Abram, nice job. So can I please explain Marxism in simple terms? Okay, now here's the thing that because of what your thesis statement, um, you know, that's something that hopefully, um, hopefully, Sienna, you're able to figure that out. So you're getting a six out of seven because of your thesis. So are you saying you're getting complex understanding, but you're not getting the point for the thesis statement? That is an odd scoring mechanism. But I'm not, there's only so much I'm really going to be able able to do Sienna without being able to, uh, you know, without being able to look at your writing and actually critique it. Um, so with that, I would say that if you've got specific questions about your writing, I think that is a that is something that, you know, you want to chat with your teacher sometime in the next couple of days and get your writing actually looked at and evaluated. And it works really well. I'm saying this as a teacher that it works really well if you let your teacher know you're willing to come in on your own time, okay? Because what that says to your teacher is that I'm willing to take a few minutes to like sit down and get advice and constructive criticism and, you know, tend to, I mean, as a teacher, when I have a student that actually cares about their exam grade and they want some help and they're willing to give some of their own time, I mean, that is, that is great. So with that, Mr. J is asking about Napoleon and Napoleon's reform. So I'll note here that I've got a handout, did Napoleon betray the French Revolution. If you Google, did Napoleon betray the French Revolution, um, it should come up on my, you know, on my website, and I've got a blog post and a handout, which I will share here, because this is how I basically, I like using Napoleon in terms of, uh, you know, I like using Napoleon in terms of, you know, how do we interpret the French Revolution? And looking at Napoleon and kind of interpreting the French Revolution through Napoleon III, I think, or not the, the third, but, you know, the main one, okay, um, is something that's helpful. So, uh, you know, did, okay, great. Oh, excellent. Okay, we've got, they've already put that in the chat. And thank you, Elena, for helping out with that. And we've got here that did Napoleon betray the French Revolution? So what we've got here is basically looking at some of his reforms. So a few things, if we look at the Concordat of 1801, Napoleon in the Concordat of 1801, he reestablished Catholic worship in France. Now note that this wasn't, you know, some people claim that Napoleon's going back to the old regime, but he's not really doing that. The old regime had the, the Catholic Church as the state religion of France, the official religion of France. And so Napoleon, this was, uh, you know, he recognized the Catholic Church as the majority religion of the French people, okay? So this is the religion of the majority. And so with that, um, you know, this majority religion, um, there's also religious toleration. So Napoleon is applying the principles of the Enlightenment, okay? Enlightenment principles of religious toleration that sure, France, the majority of French people are Catholic, but you are free to believe whatever you would like. Now, the Napoleonic Code, this is something that this is the first law code 
for all of France, okay? The first time that we see a law code for all of France, and it also, not only does it create a national law code, but it creates equality under the law, okay? So you see here that, you know, the Fr you know, France under Napoleon has equality under the law, all right? So as far as that goes, that, you know, there are some things, now, of course, also, that women, it was difficult for women to sue for divorce. Um, that basically, the during the reign of terror, they introduced for the first time in European history, probably modern Western history, they introduced no fault divorce with the with the wife being able to sue for divorce as easily as her husband. Now, no fault divorce is very normal in our society today. Very normalized that the idea that, you know, why? Why did they get a divorce? Well, they just wanted to get a divorce. Like the, the marriage was not serving them anymore. Okay. They just, uh, you know, they grew apart. This is something the Catholic Church does not recognize this. Okay. Um, you know, the Catholic Church doesn't recognize divorce divorce at all. And at the time, you know, there was no country in Europe that had any kind, you know, most countries didn't recognize, you know, divorce at all, or it was very hard to get. So Napoleon, he believed, you know, the reign of terror kind of went a little, little far with that. Now today we think, okay, why shouldn't they be able to get a divorce if they want to? So Napoleon, he reigns in the divorce laws a little bit, that there has to actually be some kind of reason. So, you know, the husband could, you know, sue for divorce on the grounds of his wife's marital unfaithfulness alone. Now, that is because from the perspective of the time, okay, so understand that I'm looking at this through the lens of their time, not ours, that we live in a an age of DNA testing and stuff like that. Whereas for them, you know, they said, well, you know, if the, uh, you know, if the wife is being unfaithful, then you don't, the husband doesn't know that the children are his. And so, you know, whereas for the wife to sue for divorce on the grounds of marital unfaithfulness, he had to bring his mistress into the family home, thereby publicly embarrassing her. So, you know, Napoleon, in some ways, you know, some of his reforms are somewhat liberal, but then there are some conservative elements as well. So there's something of a double standard, but at the same time, women could sue for divorce. Like I said, that her husband had publicly embarrassed her with his indiscretions. Also, if her husband was a criminal, if he was abusive, okay? So this is where France, under the Napoleonic Code, um, if the husband was convicted of a crime or he was abusive or anything like that, if she has a reason, she can sue for divorce. And that was actually when you put that against like not just the French in the reign of terror, but other countries in Europe, it's somewhat progressive and liberal liberal, just having a civil divorce law. And remember before the French Revolution, like the old regime had, you know, no divorce at all because the Catholic Church wasn't the majority religion, but the state religion. Now, Napoleon also created lycees, which were prep schools that people could, uh, you know, people could enroll in these prep schools and you could actually get a, uh, you know, you could actually get a scholarship if you, you know, scored high enough on a test. So, you know, from there as well, I usually think of the French Revolution in terms of liberalism and nationalism. Now, I think it's really important, not that you interpret the French Revolution a certain way, but before you go into this exam, in case there are any writing prompts having to do with the French Revolution, how do you interpret the French Revolution? What are the two or three most important values of the French Revolution to you? So, you know, Napoleon, for example, while he didn't allow, you know, you didn't have representative government, Napoleon, still claimed that his power came from the people. OK, now, by our standards, would we say that uh, Napoleon had given the people sufficient grounds to consent to his rule? No, but at the same time, there is some sort of at least nod to the people. And when you think about things like the Concordat of 1801, reestablishing the Catholic worship in France, this was something that was popular, like Napoleon's reforms tended to be popular. So another thing that we want to remember about the French Revolution is that 
nationalism, okay? The things that the Congress of Vienna is trying most to prevent, liberalism and nationalism, these are things that we saw in the French Revolution. So, you know, France, uh, you know, Napoleon, you know, uses the tricolor flag of the French Revolution. Napoleon calls himself the emperor of the French, not the emperor of France. Like basically I'm the emperor of the French people, not the emperor of France, the land. And so with that, you know, French becomes the only language of instruction. So at the time, there were still a lot of regional languages in France. And so Napoleon said, look, we've got to have the courts and the schools in the national language. OK, so those are some things that I think are important to think about when you're looking at Napoleon and especially, you know, interpreting Napoleon in reference to the French Revolution. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, the syndicate or syndicate cheating um, scandal, at some point, yeah, I do plan to get some new, you know, y'all have noted, it's been a little while since I put some fresh content on my channel. I'm planning on, uh, you know, um, alleviating that later. So Napoleon III is not Napoleon III, is not Napoleon's son. I, you know, I actually can't tell you um, what the family tree is exactly. Uh, but as far as that goes, Napoleon III, let's see what his, uh, you know, what it, a nephew of Napoleon III and, excuse me, cousin of the disputed Napoleon II. OK, and so basically Napoleon II, it looks like he, you know, he called himself emperor of uh, the French, of course, not emperor of France. Um, so he was the son of Napoleon I. So basically Napoleon's son claimed, um, you know, in June and July of 1815 to be the emperor of the French. And so Napoleon III, a nephew of Napoleon I and a cousin of Napoleon II. So, you know, after the revolutions of 1848, um, Louis Napoleon was elected president of France, okay? So he was elected president of France. And uh, then a few years later, he declares himself to be the emperor of France. So, you know, in 1848, he is elected president of France, okay? And, and Barry looks like pretty overwhelmingly president of France. So 74% um, they are electing him the president of France, okay? So they are, the people of France are wanting, you know, Napoleon, Louis Napoleon to become, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte as their leader. Because again, Napoleonic France, you know, this is where France was never greater at any time before Napoleon or any time after Napoleon. I mean, that's, I mean, Napoleon is basically the apex of French greatness. When you look at a map of Europe and the extent of Napoleon's conquest. Now, Louis XIV was a very important monarch and a very successful monarch. But at the same time, uh, you know, when we look at Napoleon, Napoleon really, um, you know, was, I mean, just France was never more on top than during Napoleon's reign. And so as far as that goes, you know, this is kind of bringing back those images of French greatness, but he declares himself to be the emperor of France. And that is at the end there, that is the end of the Franco-Prussian War that, that uh, you know, that the, the second French empire is defeated by, you know, by Germany. And that is the end of that. And then it goes to the third French Republic. So that's what we're looking at, uh, what we're looking at there with Napoleon III. And so with that, the Russian Revolution, um, Abram, I will not ignore the Russian Revolution. I don't know that we've necessarily got time to go over that. Now, uh, Noel, I would note that I've got a video on my channel on the English Civil War, okay? So as far as that, yeah, so both, yeah, so both Napoleon Bonaparte, like Napoleon the first, and Napoleon the third, they made themselves, you know, proclaimed themselves to be emperor 
of France. Okay, so um, I'm going to note here that I've got a question about the enlightened absolutists, these enlightenment monarchs. Um, the enlightened absolutists, Catherine the Great, Joseph the Second, and um, you know Frederick the Great. Now, Frederick the Great of Prussia is tending. You know, you tend to see him as the most successful of these enlightened absolutists. You know, when we think about the enlightened absolutists in general, I think about uh, I've got an acronym trap. Okay, think about the enlightened absolutists or in the trap. They are uh, they are tolerating religious minorities. They are reforming. Okay, the R is they are reforming in institutions. A, of course, is for absolutism. Duh, right? And then the P is patronage of the philosophes. So I've got a proper lecture on this on my channel, but when you look at Catherine the Great, uh, P Catherine the Great, Frederick uh, the Great of Prussia, Catherine the Great of Russia, Frederick the Great of Prussia, and Joseph II, or maybe Joseph the Not-So-Great of Austria, uh, they are all doing a combination of these things. Now, also, sometimes note that Napoleonic, uh, you know, Napoleon is sometimes referred to as an enlightened absolutist because of things like the Concordat. So as far as that, that goes, ladies and gentlemen, um, as far as that goes, we are kind of uh, going into our last time. Now, one thing we want to note here, um, the same as the, that basically Frederick the Great, know that Frederick the Great is the monarch of, you know, basically the enlightened absolutist monarch of Prussia. You need to know who Frederick the Great is. Now, other than that, you know, Frederick the Great elect, Frederick William the Great elector, the, Fred, the soldier king, like, you have all of these monarchs of Prussia whose names were either Frederick William or Frederick William. And I just refer to them collectively as the Fredericks, okay? That basically, and then of course, Frederick the Great, you need to know in particular, but I would not try to differentiate all of those Fredericks from one another. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I want to, uh, you know, want to, you know, thank you all for showing up tonight and just just note that we plan to be back on this channel, I believe, um, at, uh, you know, either 9 or 9.30 on Thursday, okay? So we will be back on Marco Learning's channel um, for the next two nights. I'm going to be broadcasting on my channel at 8, so make sure that, you know, make sure you're subscribed to Marco Learning, and at least for the next few days, that you are getting notifications. So make sure you click that subscribe button, make sure you uh, get on that bell, and make sure that you know when things are going on. So again, we do plan to be be back on this channel on Thursday night, the night before the exam. Okay, so Thursday night, the night before the exam. Let me just make sure that, yeah, so 9.30, it looks like we will be coming in um, and, uh, you know, broadcasting on this channel again. So with that, I and my friends at Marco Learning, we are going to, uh, you know, wish you a, uh, you know, wish you well on your exam. And remember, I want you to do great on your LEQ, Ari Ariana, or was that, uh, let's see, that was actually Angelina. I am wishing you luck on your DBQ no matter what the topic is. Because remember, we want to focus on not what the DBQ topic is, but that we know how to write a DBQ so that we can do well on it no matter what the topic. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I will wish y'all a good night and remind y'all it is always a pleasure.